again and welcome to Vance Talk. I am Tammy Simmons. And I'm Carla Garrick. And joining us today is the next mayor of Manchester, Victoria Sullivan. From your um, lips. If, if we have anything to say about say. it. Um, yeah, so one week from today is election day. Is it day. one week? Yes, yes it is. It's it one is, week literally. From today. November 2nd for everyone back home. Yep, if you live in Manchester. Put it on your calendar. You must come out and vote for Victoria on Tuesday. Um, polls are open from 6 in the morning till seven at night. Um, if you're not sure where you vote, um, you can go to the city clerk's website. So you go to manchesternh.gov forward slash city clerk and um, or search Manchester, where do I vote? And it'll come up and there's a link. You put your address in, it tells you where to vote. Um, really, really important election. Uh, we need really to, is. we need change. There's just, the city is just out of control. Well, I mean, it is. Uh, so, so for me, <laughs> when looking at who to pick, the important things are, you know, is the person qualified, which I think you are. Uh, your track record speaks for itself as a state rep, right? Like you did really uh, great things up at Concord, and. Uh, the schools, because half our money goes to the schools. Yeah. And, you know, we all know what happened with the re-eval. Yeah. You know, everyone's like, what? They shut us down, called us non-essential, and now they're telling us, hey, pay, pay more. us more. Exactly. The schools, yeah. um, I know you, I know you'll tell us more, but um, there was a thing in the union leader today because we've been talking a lot about the... Um, proficiency scores or lack of proficiency scores um, in Manchester our numbers dropped from 24 percent math proficiency to 14 percent math proficiency and from 34 percent reading proficiency to 27 per, uh, percent proficiency and those trying to make excuses for Joyce Craig constantly just say but it was COVID that made our numbers go down but it was COVID but the reality is is if you look at the list of um, statewide scores that were posted in the union leader today our pre-COVID scores were lower than any of the other districts post COVID scores because that's how bad it is in yes, Manchester. Yes, we did a um, press conference outside of Beach Street School last week to to shed a light on the fact that that school is so ignored in our city, and the proficiency scores were um, thirty two percent for English. Uh, then I think it was twenty three for math, and then it was like fourteen for science, mm -hmm. something like that, and. Um, the, the, a former principal came out and bashed me and said, well, you know, this was COVID. They didn't have computers. Like, no, those are the 2018, 2019 numbers. Right. Oh, right. Wow. That was, that was, <laughs> that was prior COVID. to COVID. Now they're under 10% in <sighs> that school. And, you know, the, the mayor blasted me for being there. But here's the reality. Last night, they spent the entire school board meeting addressing Beach Street School. So if that's what came out of that press conference, I'm happy because, you know, it's not about me. This race has never been about me or any one person. It's about doing what's right for our city. And if that's what it took to get attention, to start having people have the conversation about Beach Street School, which has the highest um, number of students per classroom. Doesn't that make student. you crazy? Because shouldn't, wouldn't you think that the school that is struggling the most in our city would have the lowest number of students and we'd push more students into the and schools then they closed, that are But performing. don't forget, they closed an elementary school this year. Right. Right? So they, all those kids had to go somewhere. They didn't have a plan, so they put them into the other schools. So now there's overflow in the other schools. Elementary is are the most important grades. That's where you get your foundation for all the tools that you need going forward. You know, and so I, I work for UNH, and I said the Department of Education um, with a preschool development grant. And we always say that you learn to read from K through 3, and then you read to learn from there mm, on. True. So if you're not reading, that's why the, that third grade they always use as a marker, which really shouldn't, it should be, you know, flexible. Every child is different. If you're reading at grade level by grade five, like you're still okay, right? right. Um, but that's why it's so important that we concentrate on literacy above everything else, reading skills, comprehension, because if the, you don't have those skills, you don't understand the language of math. You don't understand any of the other subjects going well, forward. Well, you don't understand anything, right? right? Because right. if you can't read, you can't critically think, and you right. can't discern things, right? So critical thinking um, with Common Core ended up being, you know, we want our kids critical thinking. Kids naturally are critical thinkers, mm -hmm. they're explorers, they're mm -hmm. adventurers, you know, they are critical think thinkers. If you leave them 
to on their do own that, to, yes. to explore and learn through play, which was why I put in the play-based kindergarten bill that became law, and it's now a template nationally, nice. um, and getting them back to play and exploration. So when we say critical thinking, though, with Common Core and this, then the social-emotional learning, when they say critical thinking, it's teaching kids to think what you think or, or the developers of those programs or curriculum think that they should think. Right. right. It's not, not critical, critical thinking. thinking. It's telling them what to think. Right. But that is just a classical, let's change the definitions in the same way, let's say something yes. like classical liberal yes. actually used to mean something. And now it means liberal means, you know, left progressive, but it yeah. actually used to mean, you know, more uh, conservative, I guess, or, or at least classically liberal. Mm. Um, yeah. So when I mean critical thinking, I mean, I know actual, what you mean. Actual I'm just thinking. saying what I'm letting people know what it means when they see it on their children's homework. That's right. Um, <laughs> It's not it, the same. So, so Beach Street Beach Street School is a mess. I mean, these they are mem- they are they are, are the worst, worst, most underserved kids. I was uh, speaking with an educator yesterday that said, you know, we also need to talk about Henry Wilson School because it is it is equally yeah. difficult for the kids and the teachers there. So, um, and we talk about Beach Street because it has the most diverse mm. population, so they have the most struggles i think but henry wilson also does so i don't want to you know I, it was right. just brought to my attention they shouldn't single out beach street no there are other schools that are really struggling but those proficiency scores were the most shocking and alarming to me and when you talk to education about people uh, about education with people i get into sometimes the education speak or the too many details but in black and white when you see proficiency scores that that speaks to everybody. Everybody understands that language. Right. And then, of course, there is that classic, I would call it the classic John DePietro chart by now. I love Actually, John Tammy, DePietro. Tammy and I have a, a, a episode where we, where, where we're the both going with this. Like this. <laughs> and that the education because, spending went up 29%. Yep. Meanwhile, we've lost almost 1,200 kids in our enrollment. And someone's vacuuming, if you yeah, hear that outside. Yeah, you can hear a vacuum. And when, when they're done, they're... maybe they could go to my house. Yeah. I'm kind of <laughs> well, a, you keep I'm talking kind of and I'm right now. Um, Brandon just went. Brandon just went. Um, so, yeah, when you're looking at that, because they keep, like, Jim O'Connell, we need more money, more money, more money. We need better management of our funds. We need better, to be better stewards of the taxpayers' money because the it, we have increased spending exponentially. Yes. And that doesn't include all of the COVID money, all of the, the ARPA money, all the other stuff that came in. And uh, the other part of that is she used some of that grant money, that, that one-time money, for new salaries and positions, non-teaching. So the taxpayers will be on the hook for that at the right. end of the day. When you see that money come in and sometimes the Alderman Bach is taking it, people don't understand that sustain that means we have to override the tax cap. We have to go higher than the budget that we had this year. Right, to because nobody it. ever wants to scale back something that they added right. you know the same thing happened happens numerous times with either police or file there'll be a there'll be a grant mm-hmm. for we can we're not paying for it it's a federal grant to add three police officers it in, is for like two money. years and then two years into it there is no way you're going to say well we need to now do away with those three police positions because the grant money's gone they're like oh no now now we just put it in the budget yeah. and now we need to raise your taxes and when i called her out on a, at the debate and i said it's not just grant money it's still taxpayer money right. it's it's still taxpayer money and she said well if we don't use it it goes back to the federal government they use it for something else well no if everybody <laughs> took a stand against it because do you remember when the money came out i think it was under bush for all the the roads and the bridges yeah. and so i think we were the one of the states that stood up against it it's right other- so if enough people stand up against it the money doesn't flow right. out of the federal government and it can come back to the people right right just saying well we need to take it because someone or someone else will isn't the right thought process either no no and that's sort of again incentives matter right Right. so it's a little bit like you know the joke about the drug addict who's like oh i just need to get you hooked on a little bit and then you'll keep coming back and really our relationship with the federal government at this stage is a little bit of that right like so they they dole out the money and then we have these programs and then it's very very hard to change things i have a question about the schools. so there was that audit report that came out that talked about because of this chart, right? So the money's going down, uh, or the money's go, the spending's going up, the results are going down. This report said we might need to close some schools. What's your sense on that? How do you think that would look? Do you do you have a sense? Should I not have asked sure. that question? No, no. You <laughs> Listen, you can always ask the question. If I don't have the answer, I will. I will tell you I don't have the answer, and I'll find it for you. Um, but when they're looking at, so this was goes back to the redistricting, right? And the the money they were looking at there. And the the problem is, we have hired 
so many more non-teaching staff, right? When they're looking at it, they want more guidance counselors. They want more. They want psychologists in the building. They want to have more paras, and they're not addressing why we need these things, mm -hmm. right? It always goes back to the right. why. Why Why do we need all these extra support staff? What's going on in our schools? And that all actually comes down to the parents. We have excluded parents from schools. They only get the phone call if we're fundraising or if the kid's in trouble. And by the time they make that phone call, it's often too late. They've, they've done a multitude right. of other things before that phone call is made, right? So part of what we're doing on the state level is we're re-engaging parents. It's Frank Ada Blue, who was our commissioner of education, who was an extremely intelligent, hardworking man that believes in parent involvement. Um, we've been working with the Karen Matt program that's available through the district. And we did it in one of our schools here and it was very successful. And then COVID hit, right? right? So it comes down to breaking down the barriers between the parents and the student and the, and the teachers and the administrators, building that trust again and having parents in the building, in the classrooms as partners in, in and having those relationships in education. Because I can tell you that I grew up in a small town, mm. and if we had a substitute that was a parent, we did not give that substitute a hard time because they knew our parents, <laughs> right? <laughs> so there's a check and balances to the community that we have lost in our schools through you know lack of leadership. So if we really want to save money, we need to engage parents, and get, then we don't need all that extra staff that is non-teaching. Right. We'd actually have funds to have more teachers in the building and right. have better curriculum. So you do not subscribe to the notion that teachers uh, or parents who are involved are domestic terrorists who should be thrown in jail. <laughs> We were called terrorists once. Oh, yeah. probably more than once. Well, well didn't the That's NBSA, the right, the National Board of yeah. School yeah. Associations yeah. or something, they they uh, actually filed a retraction over the weekend. It was it was pretty soft, but they were like, yeah, I guess we have to apologize. So Maybe federal, calling parents fed, you know. Federal law dictates parents need to be partners in education. So what they've interpreted that to be on the local levels is that they can raise money. Right, but And that's we'll not. let you know what's going on. We feel like it. So there was another um, issue with a, I think it was in Northwood, when they were having, they were starting to talk about evacuation drills, right? And they sent a letter to the parents, you know, this is some of the safety skills that we do just in case, and but we're not going to tell you when, we're <laughs> not going to tell you where we're taking your children. Oh. Yes. So like if you have a field trip, you have to sign a permission slip, you have to know where your kids are at right. all times, right? They said for safety reasons, they weren't going to tell the parents. That's where crazy. the children were and parents lost their minds but we've seen it here right at our school board meetings when parents get up to speak the, the school board rolls their eyes they tell them that they you know don't know what they're talking about um we talk about unmasking children because of what we're seeing with delay in speech because the young the little ones learn to mm -hmm. not only by hearing but by watching yeah right yeah. so we're seeing delays in speech we're seeing now the kids are getting um, chronic infection, mm -hmm. infections around their faces. We're seeing that they're having more tooth decay. And so we start to have these conversations like we, they can't be masked all day. Let's let's find a way to get them more space in the classroom, right. more ventilation. Let's look at those other things. And then, you know, when parents came forward, um, you know, Joanna, who you know, has come forward mm. before the school board several times about the masking situation. All that the school board will say is, I just want a reminder that we're in a pandemic. Yes, parents know we're in a pandemic. <laughs> we understand. But we also have to understand that we're looking, and I, I had addressed the school board with this last year um, when they were trying to figure out how to get kids back in school. I said, you're looking through a very, very small lens of COVID, the disease itself. There's so much going on around yep. here. Isolation, fear, anxiety, all the things the kids are feeling on the outside of that that no one is addressing, and it's going to be a problem. Well, we saw that Manchester was one of the last districts to go back in, even after the governor mandated it, yep. which, not a fan of mandates, but when you don't, you're, you're not agree. doing what you need to do, right? Um, they asked for a waiver. They won the last districts to come in. And now this morning, uh, an email was forwarded to me from a, a teacher at one of our schools saying, there's violence in the schools. The kids are out of control. They're not listening. That's all signs of trauma right. when it comes to kids, right? They're pushing back. They have anxiety. They're doing things. But we had ARPA funds that, that I had suggested that we used to bring kids and parents onto the school grounds, into the school buildings, with the teachers, with the administrators. Because you can't go from saying, you know, if you go near a teacher, you're going to kill them. Right. Right? Which is what we drilled into their head. You told them to... 
you can just go into the school building now. Everything's it's fine. okay. They don't transition. And the biggest lie that we tell as a society is kids are resilient. They're not resilient. That's a cop out that adults use when they've made bad choices mm. that hurt children. They'll be fine. They'll right? get over it. Obviously, they're not. If they were resilient, we wouldn't have a violence in schools. We wouldn't need rever no evacuations, right. right? Because we wouldn't have these behavioral issues. They had to cancel an assembly at Memorial. Mm -hmm. Friday night lights turned into Friday night fights, so they can't have Friday night football there anymore. They had um, they had a, a statement went out saying that there was a threat at Central that yep. they were trying to figure out if it was credible or not. And now this teacher comes out and says that the kids are completely out of control and the teachers are on the breaking point. We need to pull back and actually start leading these kids and these families and pull the families in because we are on a we we're on a course for something really really bad to happen in our schools. Worse than it already is. Worse than the scores. I mean, on a, um, on a level of violence. But the, there's no uh, way they're learning in these environments no. either, right? There's no way they're learning. No. No. Um, on the subject of violence. So don't get me started on education, because I'll just take your whole half hour <laughs> talking about education. Because it's, it's okay. Not only is it near and dear, but it is the foundation of exactly. our city. It, and if we don't get it together, we see another generation that's going yep. to fail. Yep. Right? I mean, it's, it's, and it's on multiple fronts. You're fa we're failing the children. We're failing the taxpayers who are spending a fortune. I mean, I'm, where is my return on the investment if only if one in ten kids can, has English profi proficiency, and, you know, at Beach Street School? And I'm, I'm paying a lot of money for nine kids to not be proficient in English. And, and, and the, there's this the huge knock-on effect, right? Which we all understand. If you can't read when you're eight you're probably not going to have like the most robust, right. great future. So right. we right. want to fix the problem right. and nip it in the bud yep. now. Yep. Um, but you're also now seeing if this continues, we're going to lose teachers. So right, if you're going to be worried about class sizes, you're not addressing what's happening with the right. teachers. They don't feel safe in the right. classroom. Right. If Who's going to stay in control. that environment? You know? um, I'm going to shift because yep. I want to make sure we talk about this because it's unfortunate and it's terrible. So if you are living in a bubble and not watching any news or whatever. Um, <laughs> if you're like Carla. <laughs> a, a 2019 graduate of Central it's High School was so sad. point blank murdered in Dairyfield Park over the weekend. And what's bothering me besides the fact that this is absolutely horrible. This is... I feel so bad for this uh, this um, man's family. I, just, it's awful. But I'm also being that it's now Tuesday, and this they found this um, gentleman's body Sunday, Sunday morning. morning. Yeah. So we're talking Sunday to Monday. Monday, at least 48 hours have passed, and I'm not seeing. I'm not getting the sense that um, we're being told what happened. A man was shot in the back in one of our parks, which is not the first person who's been killed in one of our parks no. recently. And he, from all accounts, uh, I talked to a man yesterday who his, his kids played soccer yeah. with him. Um, and by all accounts, he was a really good right. kid. It, so he it, was training to be a professional soccer player. Yeah. He had a great future So it doesn't him. seem like he was in the no. wrong crowd no. or anything where you can be like, well, handsome, this is just- a Handsome young man. I heard that the Congolese community was out there at the park praying and being there to support each other. and. Um, he graduated from Central. He went to Hillside, which is right near where he yeah. was murdered. Yep. Um, Trinity's across the street. McLaughlin Elementary School's right there too. This is a, this is now you know now spreading into the North End. There's yep. violence, but a young life, another young life right. lost. You know, when I and drive through the city and I see the signs that say you know justice for Chandler, we still have not given that mother answers to what nope. happened to her son. No. Nope. And this is an unacceptable path. So when I, I get so like this gets me just really angry because when I'm on a debate stage and I just keep hearing Joyce say that crime is down. Well, guess what? To this family, it doesn't matter what your statistics say. I don't say. care what the paper numbers say. There nope. is nobody. Nope. There is nobody who is being sincere who can say with a straight face that crime in Manchester is down. What Mark Twain say there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> yes. you can make the numbers look any way that yep. you want. Murders are up. Rapes are up. I don't care. If well, I mean, you know, we would do care if people are breaking into cars, but that yep. is not people's main no, concern. No, and there are um and. It's just everywhere. I mean, I literally, if I had time, which I don't, because you know there's an election in one week. Um, and if you've I had been unbelievably helpful and supportive, you both have been. Because <laughs> we need a new mayor. Um, if I had the time to sit down and like look through the newspaper day and and make a list, I can almost guarantee that I could come up with something every day of the month of October 
that should not be happening. And it's just everything. People keep telling and uh, sharing stories. I mean, I'm at work one day and there's a man drying his laundry on the bridge across from where I work. And I thought, no. that's not normal. That's just not normal. I mean, we, I, you and I have talked about this. I have had a year ago now, I had homeless people break into my home um, that I was renovating and that six people were arrested there. But since then, I've had to, you know, shoo people out of sheds. Um, a, a friend of ours, uh, Liz Going, who lives up in the North End, shared her uh, thoughts because mm -hmm. she used to live on the West Side and she was talking about how terrible things were. And this was while Joyce Craig was mayor and how um, she eventually bought a home in the North End and how completely out of touch she feels her neighbors are with what's actually happening in the rest of the city. That, they, you know, they're all, they just live up there and everything's peachy keen and everything's wonderful. But for the rest of us that go into the city or live in the city, I mean, I put, even our house on Varney Street, yeah. I, I find it amazing that I look out the window and I'm like, what's that person doing over there? And you watch them and you can tell that they're on drugs and they're not, and they're climbing over guardrails and you're like, I don't know where they're going. Yeah, so I live on the South End. I live on South Beach Street, and I was down there. You, I've, I've talked about the trails. You know, they <sighs> like to say that 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 homeless man that was stabbed was behind Home Depot because it sounds it sounds sort of, less scary yeah, if it's behind it's Home more Depot. More distance, yeah. yeah, right? It's yeah, it's kind of um, sterile, right? Right. So, but they don't tell you that the <laughs> that trail is behind a neighborhood, yes. right? Right. So it was really stabbed behind someone's house. Yes. Um, and then I went down because people said we we continuously have problems with an encampment at Cracker Barrel because Walmart's uh, yeah. right there, right? Yeah. So it's easy access to phone, uh, charge their phones, have bathrooms, everything else, and. The, the funny part is they have one of their walls is a huge Joyce Craig sign. <laughs> and they have cornhole because I stumbled yes, across do. that putting up signs. I was like, what is that business over there? Because in the distance, I could see a cornhole board. And I'm like, I don't think there's any clubs or any. And as I got closer, I was horrified because I was like, oh, that's the homeless encampment. Yeah. And they have cornhole. So now so they, they okay. they've built a house. It's, I've got to say, though, like, I don't know if they're watching Alone, you know, this TV show yeah. Alone. Their, their survival skills are, are, like, great. Like, I want, like, maybe maybe they can have a job with teaching people how to survive <laughs> outside. But they built a house out of, out of like, trees and sticks and logs. And it's right underneath the underpass for yeah. the highway yeah. um, where there's, you know, they're also sheltered from other things. But it's right in the middle of the trail, too. Yeah. So, like, so the people... trails are not usable. And when people say, well, they can go to the shelter. So I was at the shelter the other day. Um, and I was actually down there with Paul Feely to do, you know, the, the on the way to the road to the election sort of yep. thing. And I said, listen, there's a protest down at the shelter. Do you want to go down and talk to them? So we went down and we started talking to them. We ended up spending an hour talking to the people at the shelter about how horrible the conditions are. They were showing me their arms. They have bites from all the bed bugs and infections. And um, the lift doesn't work. So this lady in the wheelchair has to sleep in the cafeteria because she can't get upstairs. There's a man who has one leg. His cot is upstairs. The lift doesn't work. So he's actually dragging his body up a flight of stairs, right? Um, as they described it, a bed, bed bug ridden stairwell. Um, the showers weren't working. They ran out of food one time. They didn't have pillows. They didn't have blankets. So this this shelter gets two and a half million dollars a year. The salaries combined are almost a half a million dollars for the people that are running it, right? And these people don't have any place to, that they can feel safe. And they also can't stay there during the day. Mm. So that's why we're seeing them in the parks and everywhere mm. else. So they're not going to job training. They're not going to, you know, mental right. health support. They're, just going they're back not out going into to the treatment. Street. They're just going back onto the street. So until we figure out how to give them the, the basic necessities mm -hmm. so that they can actually get some footing so they can get jobs and they can get employment, then we're going to see this continue to increase right. because now it's in all of our backyards, right? right? And it can't just be, a, we've had uh, this literally. conversation. Yeah, literally. <laughs> you, you can't just add more shelter beds and think it solves the problem. Nope. It just is another Band-Aid on an ongoing problem that's, like you said, reaching into all of our neighborhoods now because it isn't just in the tree streets like people used to say. I work with um, a woman who has lived in our country for 15 years and she said when she first moved here, she was amazed at how safe it was because she's from Brazil where yeah. she says literally, they say if you, if you ring the newspaper, it will drip blood because that's how bad the crime in Brazil is. But she said she was 
loved that it was so safe. And she said, and it was always just that one little section that you kind of avoid, the tree streets. And everybody, that was always the thing. And even then, I never used to feel like those were really that bad. Now, I don't know. I went, you... You called me one day and said, go check out the park. Check out Victory Park because there was there was dozens and dozens of people laying all over the place. Yeah, I, mean, I would say, I, I literally I would had estimate 50 people at least easily. In, in the, in and the I, I, I'm a fairly resilient person. I don't scare easy or whatever. And I pulled up and I'm in my car and I got the window open just a little and I'm locking the doors because I can't see what that group of people over there is doing because there's like people with cars and car doors open and you don't know. Yeah, it's, I mean, as, as totally an immigrant bad. who also moved, you know, from, from a dangerous yeah. country, uh, that was something I really loved about New Hampshire, I think, was, you know, it was very prosperous. There mm-hmm. were actually never panhandlers in New no. Hampshire till about no. four or five years yep. ago. Now, of course, that's a combination of the opioid crisis, but it is also, you know, and people don't like it when we say this, but the reality is you get more of what you subsidize. Yes. So if you are going to spend all this money being like, yes, we're going to allow you to just, you know, not work and not try and clean up your life and not get off the drugs and not whatever, right? It seems like it's compassionate, but over the long term, it's not. What you're doing is you're creating a a vibe where it's permissible. And then we're just saying, oh, we're going to spend more and more money on, um, on this problem. And I will tell you, and I tweeted this at Joyce Craig last week, you know, I was down at the ice rink Uh, on the west side. I like to walk that trail. And there is a brand new village, homeless village that opened up in the last two weeks. And I'm like, like a real village. Like there are eight tents with like tarps in between and all of it. Because they broke up the Econo Lodge. Yes. So they keep doing that. And then they send the problem into our neighborhoods. I would like that not to happen. You've got two minutes to go. Yep. Make your pitch. You got one week till you're going to Yeah, one week from today. So I want to just let you all know we're getting uh, out to get the vote out on this Saturday. If you want to join us, meet us at 814 Elm Street at 930 AM. We will give you people to walk with and lists. But we need all boots on the ground. Joyce has all the unions. She had pictures with them yesterday that are working against the taxpayers. So if you are a taxpayer, if you are a parent in this city, if you want to have a safer city, come out and help us out. Spread the word. Make sure you get out November 2nd. And if you need more information about me, what I stand for, who I am, go to Manchester, I'm sorry, go to VictoriaSullivanForMayor.com and you can find out more about the campaign there. You can also make a donation and you can sign up to help yep we need your help we need your help on election day um we just need to change things yep yeah and, and it the, change the starts with family each of, us. of this young man i just want to say this is an unacceptable loss for our yep. city and we just have to we have to make sure it doesn't happen again i agree change vote next tuesday that's all we got all right thank you for coming on yay go team thanks you guys, victoria you guys need an hour so. okay fine. <laughs> that's what everybody says take care guys we'll see you next week Bye. Oh.